<laughs> Almost like a tablas. <laughs> no, not, not quite. quite. <laughs> I don't know, no, that's, that's what I said. Oh, did. you mentioned that? Yes. Watching Ravi Shankar today? Oh, really? Uh, no, we were watching a. Uh, we watching yeah, Ravi Shankar. Right, and, that's true. Okay, without further ado, because time is, uh, is limited, mm -hmm. somebody was asking me, oh, what are you doing? beating on the bongos, bongos, and I want to say to him, therapy, pal, therapy. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good meditational device. Mm. Okay, having said that, I'm going to take us right into where we stopped for a reason. Oh, and we I'll, finished? Well, you'll see what I'm talking about in just a sec. Oh, okay, I thought you finished the Snake I did. 2020. At the conclusion of the snake 2020. this book. Yes, okay, hold At on. the conclusion oh, of Snake okay. 2020. Yes, sir. Here's what happened. All right. Uh, Kojo's girlfriend, his good friend in Ghana, wrote him this letter. Mm -hmm. Dear Kojo, Charles has returned. He is older, has suffered serious psychological wounds from the war, from the war in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. But aside from what he's feeling, aside from that, he's feeling full of piss and vinegar, as you say, in America. He came back to me unexpectedly, which is the way things like that happen. And once again, I must admit that your presence helped prepare his coming. Mm. I'm happy that matters have turned out the way they turned out for us. I must admit that I couldn't have imagined a scenario to fit our circumstances. God does, indeed, does indeed work in mysterious ways. Mm. Ghana is going on, sometimes ahead, sometimes behind, but always on. We discover new things, people, ways, and means every day. Please be aware, we have found, according to the villages of Chito, that Asiafo, the wizard, left a son behind. Mm. Not you. Mm. I don't know what else to say. Uh -huh. The book that I'm about to read Mm -hmm. It's called The Snake Doctor. Ah. And this is the son of As Asiafo, oh. the wizard. Wow. He That's was discovered, well, as the as the son of a young woman that uh, that the Asiafo had seduced and had a child with. Oh, I yes. can't wait. Okay. Uh, Please. I don't want to get salacious here, but uh -huh. that's what happened. The uh -huh. photo on the front yes. was taken by none other than the inimitable Zola Selena Hawkins. Uh -huh. And the photo on the back was taken by none other than the inimitable Zola Selena Hawkins. You got it, kid. So. All right. The photo on the front is representing Asiafo. Oh, Asiafo's son. Asiafo. Asiafo's son. Uh-huh. Looks just like Asiafo. 
Ah. Looks just like Yes, it. yes, he does. Yes, but he does. But sometimes, you know how genes do. Uh -huh. They pass along certain kinds of traits. Okay, definitely. Oh. But he is... Um, we'll get into what he is and what he's about. Oh, okay. Right now. All right. Uh, I'm going to start with chapter one and end with chapter one. I Just as a little, uh, a little, little hors d'oeuvre, gotcha. so to speak. All right. But remember, for those who've been following the story and stories, mm -hmm. that Asiafo was this this Tarzan, this black Tarzan in the forest in northern Ghana mm -hmm. that uh, Kojo Bediako Brown uh, stumbled into when he went to spend a week in the village of Chito, mm -hmm. and Asiafo promised him many things. Well, basically one great thing is that he would have the money to do this, this film that he wanted to do. Every, every filmmaker has a film in mind, the film. Yes, yes. And uh, circumstances uh, allowed Kojo to do what he wanted to do. Yes. Right. Except when it came to the very end, and uh, Asiafo, in the form of a snake, asked that Kojo and his wife, Akuzawa, give him their firstborn. And he couldn't go for that, so he beat the snake to pieces. He beat him to death. Shortly thereafter, he gets uh, information from his girlfriend in Ghana that Asiafo had been found with a fractured skull and beaten on the road. And what he uh, has to do at this point is to reaffirm uh, the matching time frames to see whether or not Asiafo was killed at the same time that he killed the snake. Uh, it would be kind of uh, supernatural to say that the snake was killed and that was Afia Asiafo or vice versa, but that's the nature of what happens in the Pan-African occult. Uh -huh. Chapter one of the Snake Doctor. Ooh. I think my great-grandfather Kwame was the first person I had ever known personally to die. I was 10 years old. About death, what do you think about death at that age? I had seen dead animals here and there, but a dead person is a totally different thing. Great grandfather was 104 when he died of natural causes. Mm -hmm. 104 seemed to me to be as old as a human being could be. Mm -hmm. Doing the math, I imagined him having 10 lifetimes plus four years before I was born. Mm -hmm. He was old when he lived, when he died, but he never seemed to be old when he was alive. Mm -hmm. Kofi, tell me what you learned in school today. Ah, uh, yesterday, sorry. He was always asking about school, about how I felt about... Oh, incidentally, I want to say that Kofi is Kojo's son. Oh, yes. I get that straight. Mm -hmm. Kofi, tell me what you learned in school today, yesterday. He was always asking me about school, about how I thought about this and that. And he would sit there in his favorite chair and give me his complete attention. Mm -hmm. That was one of the things I liked about visiting him. He was always interested in what I was interested in. So you want to be a snake man, huh? Hmm. That's what he called a herpetologist. A person who studies snakes, snake behavior. Mm -hmm. He was the first one in our family to find out about my interest in snakes. 104 years old. Mm -hmm. I stood at the side of his casket and stared at his profile. He seemed to be sleeping. Mm -hmm. He died of natural causes. That one puzzled me for a bit. I asked my father about it. I was always asking questions about something or other. Dad, if great-grandfather died of natural causes, what would an unnatural cause be? Hmm. 
Well, a bullet through the head would be somewhat unnatural, don't you think? Mm -hmm. I thought my dad and his mom and dad, my paternal grandparents, were some of the smartest people on the planet. They had original answers to any question I asked them. Granddad, Kofi, and Grandma and Jinga were as busy as two middle-aged people could be with their bookstore, but they always had quality time for me, no matter how busy they were. What's on your mind, young man? That was the way uh, Grandfather Kofi and Grandma and Jinga usually set me up. Mom's parents, my, my maternal grandparents, Minerva and Harvey, were quite different. It wouldn't take a genius to figure out that they were much more involved with things, with material stuff, rather than ideas. They always gave me presents. They always give me presents, things. I love them very much, both of them. But there are times when I wish they would back away from the gift shop. Mom told me, that's the way they are, Kofi. That's the way they've always been. Mom and Dad, they named me Kofi after Granddad and because I was born on Friday are, slash, have been the checks and balances in my life. Dad, the filmmaker, writer, producer, director. Mom, the writer. Like I said earlier, I was always asking questions about one thing or another. And I have to give them, Mom and Dad, my grandparents, Dad's sign, credit for encouraging me to ask questions. Grandson, if you don't ask questions, People will assume that you know everything just the way all the rest of the young folks do these days. <laughs> My great-grandfather had a very dry sense of humor, so dry it could make your cheeks pucker before you smile. I had the questions and they had the answers. Oh, Dad must have told me a zillion times, if I don't have the answer to your question, we'll go to your mouth. And if she doesn't have the answer, we might have to go to the library. <laughs> After calling one of my parents to supply me with answers to the most naive, most esoteric questions, except for my father when we got to snakes. I was always very interested to in snakes for some reason. I couldn't explain where my interest came from, but it was there, full blown. I was fascinated by, by snake lore. The unusual, mainly evil history snakes, how they made it, the ways they hunted for their food, but more than anything, their poisons. I knew, for example, that the venom from various snakes, like the king cobra, was being used to treat uh, neuromuscular disorders. Ten years old, and I was seriously thinking about a career in herpetology, specializing in the creative scientific use of snake venom to deal with Parkinson's fibromyalgia, Alzheimer's, stuff like that. I was more than a little bit surprised to discover that my dad wasn't 100% behind me. Why her pathology, son? What can I say? I don't know, dad, it's just something I'm interested in. Well, son, it's natural to be interested in a lot of things when you're 10 years old. Why don't you feel around a bit, explore a few other career fields before you Settle into that uh, specific groove. I nodded in agreement, but his attitude really puzzled me. Dad was usually so open about uh, whatever I flung at him. If I came to him and told him I wanted to go skydive and scuba dive and drive a truck for a living or become a doctor, nurse, veterinarian, chef, whatever, he was always open to the idea. It took me a long time to find out why he wasn't enthusiastic about herpetology. <laughs> Father Kojo, I would have been blind and not see that Kofi was interested in snake from the time he could crawl. It would have been really hard for me to explain to him, to anybody, why I didn't want to encourage his interest in snakes. My dad, the, the bookstore owner, noticed Kofi's interest in snakes and was always giving him books about snakes on his birthdays, for Kwanzaa, whenever I was really in a bind. I mean, how could I tell my dad, my son, my wife, 
about my deal with Asiafor to visit. And how a snake came to be the main character in the piece. I must have done a flashback about Asiafo the wizard and the deal I made with him for years. I'm 46 years old now, a successful writer, producer, director. Got all the goodies I think I need. And it may all stem from a deal that I made with a guy in the forest in Ghana 20 years ago. Just for the record, my parents sponsored me to a trip to the motherland, to Ghana, West Africa, when I was 18 years old. Maybe they saw it as a rite of package, uh, passage kind of thing. In any case, I went to the continent, as my grandfather Kwame used to call it. In our Afrocentric family, it was ordinary for one family member or another to be making a trip to Africa every year. Sometimes it would be family groups. Don't allow them to lock you outside of Africa, Kojo. They've been trying to do that ever since they brought us over here. That's what my grandfather used to say, at least once a week. And mom and dad weren't far behind him. Kojo, you have to think about Africa. It has to be a part of your consciousness. Otherwise, you'll be caught up in this negative bag that so many of our, our young and some not so young African-American sisters and brothers have been swept into. And we're not just simply talking about those who go around calling each other niggas. My family was a rock bed foundation for my Africanity, and I blessed them for that. My first trip to Ghana was a blast. All I need to do is sit still, daydream for a hot minute, and I'm back in Africa. The trip would have been a huge success if I had only done two things, met Comfort Latte and Grace Vivian Hulabar. Comfort Latte mm -hmm. and Grace Vivian Hulabar. Mm -hmm. Eighteen years old, hormones racing like fire engines. Mm -hmm. I'm sure if it hadn't been for the packages of condoms that mom and dad insisted that I carry, I would have had at least two pregnant young women in Ghana. Mm. Yeah, Ghana. Mm. Africa really opened my eyes to a lot of stuff. I got a chance to see, to experience what effect, for example, colonialism had on the African psyche. Never will forget the, the billboard with the blonde Jesus on Danqua Circle. The subservient ways many Africans behave whenever any European showed his face. The poverty, the malaria. Kojo, when you get to Africa, to Ghana, you'll have a few people attempt to, attempt to make you feel inferior. Feel bad because you're an African American. Don't buy into it. Some Africans have an almost Japanese attitude toward us. Wow, that's, <laughs> that's a little too far ahead of me. A Japanese attitude? Sounds crazy. But let me explain. Some, many Japanese, even today, blame the victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki for their misfortune, for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Comically speaking, that's the Japanese attitude some Africans have toward us. The Africans in the diaspora. If your karma had been correct, you wouldn't have been carted off into slavery. Mm. That's like blaming the victim for being a victim. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, you won't find as much of that attitude as your mother and I found the first time we tripped to West Africa. I can honestly say that I didn't find the Japanese attitude to be as strong for me as it was for my, for my parents. But I still, I, I still felt tinges of it. I mean, why weren't we given a diaspora welcome instead of being directed to go stand in line with the rest of the Obruni, mm -hmm. the Europeans? Mm -hmm. That really put a wild hair up my ass for a few minutes. I asked because I always asked, whatever, why are the Africans from the diaspora given more preferential treatment? After all, we're returning to our ancestral home. I got a few fuzzy answers and one realistic reply. The realistic reply came from Comfort Larty, one of the young women I had seduced on my third day in the section of Accra called Osu. Mm -hmm. Kojo, 
you must look at this from, from our perspective. It doesn't matter that you are not fair skinned and that you do not have curly hair. What matters is that you do not know which village your ancestors came from and more importantly where they are buried. What matters is that you do not speak the Gama, Chi, Adangme, Nzema, Ewe, or any of the other languages in Ghana here. Would I receive greater acceptance if I spoke God, tree, or Ewe? Probably not. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, this language is just a language. It is the culture above and below the language that counts. It's not about color. It's about culture. So you're saying that I could never claim my African roots, no matter what I did? I didn't say that. I'm just saying that the culture makes you a Ghanaian, a Nigerian, a Fon, or whatever. There are some Lebanese born in Ghana here who are more African than you could ever be. We call you a Bruni because that's what you are. If you walk like a duck, squawk like a duck, and act like a duck, then we must call you a duck. Understand me well, Kojo. Mm. There is nothing personal about you. Mm. You walk like an American, you talk like an American, and so we call you an American. So what's wrong with that? There's a whole lot wrong with that. Mm. Number one, it just kicks my African side completely to the curb. Mm. You say, ah, forget about it. Comfort. Look, it would take about four years of African, Caribbean, South, North, American studies for you to understand what I'm trying to explain. Are we still going to see the Ghana National Dance Ensemble this evening? Yes, please. There was an awful lot about that six weeks away in Ghana that turned me on my ear. I knew when I got on the KLM flight back to Los Angeles at Kotoko Airport that I wanted to return to Ghana. Mm -hmm. And so we end chapter one. Oh my goodness, so quickly. Yes, it comes fast, but All right. uh, we'll get back into it. You'll see. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. You want me to go on to chapter two? Please. Oh. Yes, please. All right. The opening chapters are brief because it builds up. Uh. Eight years later, after four years of battling the racist bastards in the USC film school. Uh, sorry, Mr. Brown, we just don't have an authority who can validate your thesis, a uh, film short. Your claim that there were African explorers in the Polynesian, uh, Melanesian islands. We'll have to ask you to pick another subject area. They, they came before Columbus, Ivan Van Sertima. How about him? Mm. Mr. Brown. <laughs> the film committee can definitely appreciate your desire to uh, focus on unknown African presences here and there. Mm -mm. But we must, insist, you just, must insist, insist that your subject areas pass certain benchmarks. This new subject area, they came before Columbus, for example. We don't have any hard evidence to substantiate your premise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay. In other words, you can't find a white PhD who's willing to admit what I'm saying is the truth. And you won't accept the credentials of the African American historians that I've submitted. Ivan Van Sertima, Dr. John Henry Clark, Dr. Diop, and all the rest. Four solid years of arguments, debates, disagreements. At one point, midway into my junior year, I was half a finger snap from slapping the shit out of two of my racist snake dog asshole instructors, turning a desk or two over, calling most of the people in the film school a sack load of motherfuckers and stomping off to Brazil Ooh. or the Congo or somewhere. Ooh. Okay. I was pissed. Okay. Oh. Still pissed. Mom and Dad set me down in the library, our serious comfort room, opened a bottle of Harvey's Bristol Cream, <laughs> then quietly, coolly spelled the past, the present, and the future out to me. Mm -hmm. Now that I think back on it, I have the feeling that they had carefully orchestrated their talk with me. Mm -hmm. Dad came first, 
with the past. Mm -hmm. Mom laid out the present and they took interwoven shots at my head with the future. Mm -hmm. Now Kojo, let's make this clear and simple. We can't allow you to drop out of school because of racism. Personally, I think that would be a slap in the face of all of our ancestors. All of those brothers and sisters who struggled gave their lives for us, for you to be able to get, go to where you are. I'm sure you'll have to agree with me when I say we told you so. We told you from day one that this place has a racist foundation. So you can't tell us that you thought you were going to go into this institution and find a level playing field. The lessons of the past have taught us that this place and its institutions have deep reservoirs of racism. You hear what I'm saying? What else could I do but sip my sherry and nod in agreement? From time to time, the reservoirs seem to be at a lowered level, especially when there's a large-scale war or some other national crisis that forces the usual suspects to reach out for all the colored hands and bodies they can find. But as soon as the dark class, the dark cloud passes, things tend to return to what to where they were. Don't misunderstand me what I'm what I'm saying. Racism is, has been, and probably always will, always will be a thread in this society's fabric. You know why? Mm -hmm. Because the usual suspects would have to do three radically different things. Number one, they would have to tell the absolute truth about how the Europeans cheated, stole, and took this land away from the indigenous people. Mm. Number two, they would have to tell the absolute truth about the role that the African importees slaves played in the development of this new world. Mm -hmm. Number three, they would have to be willing to share the power. And as you know, that's something they've never done and they're not very likely to do in the very near future. Mom slid right in behind Dad, said, right after Dad said, soon. Mm. Kojo, think about it. Films, movies are the audiovisual aids of this time. Film, video, TV, CDR, VCR, all of this stuff has ulterior objectives. Me and your father haven't been to a movie in years. Why? Because they're not making films for people like us, for thinking people. They can give us a bunch of gobbledygook, gender, demographic, age crap about movies being made only for 15 to 35-year-olds, uh, whatever they choose to call it. The truth of the matter is that they cornered a herd of non-thinking people and decide to force feed them chewing gum for the eyeballs and the emotions. Bubble up stuff that explodes on cue and completely lacks substance. That's what makes your presence on the scene so desirable and so necessary. Because hmm. uh, don't you understand what your mother's saying? What else could I do but nod and sip? <laughs> My mom and dad were spellbinders. They could whip my ass with their logic harder than any other weapon in their arsenal. Mm -hmm. Kojo, let me follow up with what your mother was saying. We need you, son. We need to have the alternative perspective your eyes and your sensitivities are going to bring to the scene. Mm -hmm. It's never been easy, Kojo, never. I can't think of any conscious African-American woman Who's ever given birth to a child, male or female, and thought, well, no, that's done, they got it made. <laughs> no, my son, it's yeah. never been that way with us. We've always been forced to think, what can I do to put a firewall up for this boy, this girl? Because mm -hmm. I know the virus is lurking everywhere. Yes. What your mother says is true, Kojo, and that goes for the African-American man also. Mm -hmm. It does give you a good feeling to know that you are the father of a son, a daughter, who's going to be pounded on by the society that this child is born into. You're a filmmaker, Kojo, a person who has the vision to turn some of this racist craziness around, 
a person who can give America a different slant on itself. Mm -hmm. Coach, I think you have a sacred obligation on your shoulders. Look, look. You might have to endure a little racist nonsense, bullshit for a little while. And that's regrettable. No doubt about that. But the sacrifice you make will benefit a whole slew of people coming after you. Mm -hmm. And make no doubt about it. There are bunches of them waiting in the wings. The question they will be asking is, did Kojo make it? Kojo, I think your mother has basically put the whole thing in a nutshell. So I'm not going to belabor the point. All I would like to suggest to you finally is that you put your personal agenda, goals, ego, on ice for a little while longer. We're not asking you to bow down and kiss anybody's booty or anything like that. We're just asking you to put racism into its proper perspective and keep on stepping. Hmm. What if, what if, what if uh, Harriet Tubman, Henry Box Brown, Mary McLeod Bethune, George Washington Carver, Dr. Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. Marcus Garvey, Dr. John Henry Clark, Obama, and God only knows how many others had decided, hey, this racism is too heavy for me, I got to give up. Mm -hmm. Maybe the sherry was a contributing factor, but I left our family conference feeling energized. Mm -hmm. Shit, I was Kojo Bediaco Brown, son of Kofi and Njinga Brown. Mm -hmm. What right did I have to give up to surrender? It was no contest from that point on. I went on a satirical historical charade that completely messed my academic screeners up. In rapido succession, I made requests to do 15-minute student films about the Scottish discovery of chitlins. <laughs> okay. The Scottish discovery of chitlins. Mm -hmm. The European discovery of a tribe of Kalahari people in Eastern Europe who had lost their way due to the effects of global warming. Mm. The African-American pimp and how he came to be. I used visual subliminals to suggest that African-American pimping at the street level was a subversion of the African-American's place in American life. Hmm. Some of the people at USC grew to hate my guts for twisting their comfortable little shit around, but there were others. They've asked me not to reveal their names, who gave me lots of encouragement. Mm -hmm. In any case, I survived my junior year doubts and climbed up out of the USC film school cesspool smelling like a rose. Wow. Mm -hmm. It didn't take long at all for me to get a whole bunch of assistant director, second unit director, associate producer gigs. I was a USC film school grad, mm -hmm. and the powers that are gave me some brownie points for having endured, persevered, and stuck it out. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Kojo, unusual name. We see here that you're a USC film school grad. Mm -hmm. ah, I did it all. Mm -hmm. Instructional films, industrial films, anti-AIDS films, whatever. In every case, I made it my business to tweak it with my own special sense of style to put on that Kojo touch. Uh -huh. Over the period of four years, I was in a very good spot. I had set up my own production company. I was preparing myself to explore the outer perimeters of the creative, lucrative world. Mm -hmm. Kojo, remember, artists may start off being hungry, but they don't have to stay hungry, dig it? Thank you. It was time to go back to Africa again, to Ghana, to feel that feeling again. I was 25, a good age to be. So the minute, the window open, I flew. Ghana, in the forms of the two sisters I dealt with during the course of my first trip, had changed radically. Comfort Latte and Grace Hulibor, Grace Vivian Hulibor mm -hmm. were as different as proverbial day and night when I first met them at the wise old age of 18. Mm -hmm. Comfort was about as radical as the Ghanaian circumstances would allow her to be. I don't care what the Europeans say, it's all a crock of crap. Hmm. Grace was at the other end of the, of the pole. Think about it, Kojo. If the English had not come to Ghana, we would still be having tribal wars and worshipping fetish gods. I can't say what happened because I wasn't there to see the change that occurred, but a change had occurred. Comfort 
the radical bohemian had become a religious nut or conservative. Kojo, I can't do this with you, what we used to do, because Jesus wouldn't like that. If you don't tell him, I won't tell him, and everything <laughs> will be cool. You are blaspheming, and you may be forced to pay for your transgressions by spending an eternity in hell. Mm -mm. As my lawyer friend, Horace Hennessy Harper, used to say, I absconded from comfort without any malice of forethought. Hello. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Grace took up the slack. Mm. Oh, Kojo, I am so pleased that you have returned. Mm -hmm. Wow, she made me feel like the prodigal lover. It didn't take me long to find out that the older African-American brother, 35 maybe, had been on the scene during our interim separation. Charles introduced me to jazz music. Mm -hmm. Okay. I couldn't slash wouldn't allow myself to have jealous pangs or anything like that. After all, when I split back to America, we hadn't signed a mutual romantic agreement or anything like that. Hello. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, yes. we'd made some real good love, no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. But we hadn't created a foundation for anything. Mm -hmm. In some ways, it made things better between us. I hadn't told her any lies, and she hadn't offered me any false hopes. We fell into each other's arms and offered each other lots of emotional space. I wasn't simply in Ghana for her, I was in Ghana for the sake of being in Ghana. Mm. She understood that. Mm -hmm. That's why I wound up spending time in a village called Chito. Mm -hmm. So, my African-American man, you want to go see how life is in the village, eh? Mm -hmm. Well, you shall have your wish. Give this note to my auntie Eugenia in the village called Chito. So that's how I wound up spending a week mm -hmm. in the village of Chito mm -hmm. and making the acquaintance of Mr. Asiafo the wizard. Wow. But first, first a few words about the village called Chito. Unless something incredible has changed in the last few days, you're not likely to find a place on the map anywhere, not even in Ghana. It's in the northeastern section of the country, be somewhere between here and there, about 12, 1400 people. It's unusual in the sense of having a young population as well as an old population. It's one of those places where all of the young people have not jumped up and gone to the big city. Why should I leave Chito? I love this place. <laughs> yeah. It would be hard for me to figure out what there was to love in Chito. There were only two taps of running water in the whole village, and sometimes when the dry season, the harmaton comes, the water stops flowing. During the rainy season, from May to September, the place is like a mud hole. There's no telephone service. Someone told me while I was there that they had had two telephones at one time, but something happened to spoil them, and they we are waiting for repairs to come. People grow their own food, mm -hmm. corn, beans, okra, plantains, mangoes, sugarcane, and they raise chickens and pigs. There's a forest surrounding Chito, which uh, supplies wild game, mostly bush meat mm. and deer. Okay. The people are relatively healthy, but there are no extras, no luxuries. Chito is not the place to go if you want to see bright lights and dancing girls. I went there because I wanted to experience the real Ghana. Mm. Accra, Kumasi, Tamale. The big cities are just like big cities everywhere, overpopulated, dirty, unhealthy. Right. So, my African-American mind, you want to go see how life is in the village, eh? Those were Grace's words and her note to her Aunt Eugenia and Chito was my passport to the primitive life and my meeting with Asiafa. Grace, Grace Vivian Hulivar. Of course, I knew that Kojo had another girlfriend when he came to Ghana here the first time. It was no big thing. We were very young. He was an exciting experience for me, a wild African-American boy, and he was nice to me. Mm -hmm. When he went back to America, I thought I would never see him again. We exchanged letters, birthday cards, that sort of thing. But we did not make any great promises to each other. 
He came back for another visit after an eight year absence. In the interim, mm, mm -hmm. going right along with my life, I met another African American guy. Charles Howard was an art entrepreneur who had set his sights on becoming a man with serious money. He saw Ghana, West Africa as an untapped source of wealth. Grace, your country has so much to offer the world. I would like to see a film industry develop here, one that would create and export world-class films to the world. I would like to have at least four Ghana dance ensembles on tour in Europe, Asia, and the U.S. I would bet you even money that many people would get a big kick out of seeing some of the, the great traditional plays, the things about the supernatural and all of that. Charles was an older man. Well, I was 19 and he was 30 when we met, so I guess I could say he was an older man. He introduced me to African-American jazz to find food, sophisticated people, and the good life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I had to compare the two, I would say that Kojo was a wild, free spirit, full of himself, a creative mind. Charles was rather laid back, more focused on the material aspects of life. I have to feel that the gods, Daddy Tope Wo, were very gracious to me to have allowed both of these beautiful men in my life. I was quite surprised to hear that Kojo was coming back to Ghana after eight years. I was not under any illusions. I didn't know if he was coming back to spend time with me or with the other one. Mm -hmm. Ghana is small, small, and everybody knows everything about everybody. Mm -hmm. Charles was in London, fortunately, to do business during the time Kojo was visiting. Mm -hmm. And I felt no compulsion to tell Charles anything about Kojo, nor did I feel any need to say a lot about Charles to Kojo. Mm -hmm. I did let Kojo know that there was a man in my life, and I let it go with that. I knew he was sophisticated enough to deal with the situation. Mm. Honestly speaking, I felt deliciously wicked. <laughs> I was having a chance to have my cake and my pie too. <laughs> I was somewhat annoyed with Kojo for wanting to take a week away from me to go to a remote village to experience the real Ghana. I had no idea he would go to Chito and become involved with that awful creature in the forest, that man thing called Asiafo. I knew something of Asiafo from the stories that had been passed down to me from my elders. The story of how Asiafo and his mother were caught having sexual relations. The mother was burned alive in a hut as a witch. The boy cast out into the forest to die. The story of how somehow the boy managed to survive and develop incredible powers. Mm -hmm. These stories were already old when I was a small girl. Someday the few people who had very serious problems went to Asiafo and he helped them solve their problems. I cannot say that this is true or false. My auntie Eugenia and those who live in Chito have always spoken of Asiafo as a evil spirit demon thing. Mm. And I accepted the opinion based on the history of the man. Who else but a demon could go into the forest alone and live for many years? Mm. Now, my African-American man meets with this creature and comes back to Accra talking about some kind of deal he has made with this, with this person. Mm -hmm. And that is the end of chapter two. Wow. And we will continue with chapter <sighs> three. Thank you. This Dr. time Dr. tomorrow. Yes, please. Uh, All right. To, to my friends who asked the question about uh, Juju, mm -hmm. uh, all I can say is that I don't know a lot about it, but uh, it seemed to work for some people. Mm -hmm. It's like quid pro quo. You want something, you give up something. Yes, yes. You, be careful, be Did careful, be careful. That. The crossroads, yes, uh -huh, definitely. Well, this book, The Snake Doctor, can be purchased uh, on... This book? Yes, on 
Author House oh. and, and on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or just go to your local bookstore and say, I would like to purchase The Snake Doctor by Odie Hawkins. And you see the picture on the front. Indeed. All right. <laughs> it was, it was, yes, this, you yes, see. I see, I see, I see. And your website is www.odiehawkins.com. If you like this video, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you will have more moments in time with Odie Hawkins and Zola Selena Hawkins. We shall see you hey, tomorrow. Hey, everybody, everybody stay safe and well. See you tomorrow. I see.